non-binaries or translators of women and or non-binary authors or both. We're delighted to be co host Women in Translation series, which enriches our regular schedule of readings submitted by translators from all over the world. If you'd like to find out more about Jill or submit a reading yourself, please check our website at jillreading.com. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce one of the moderators of today's event, Anna Dinwiddie. Anna Dinwiddie is a poet and translator by intersections of landscape, belief, and words. She received a Catherine Bakeless Nason Scott to attend Breadloaf Translators Co Conference in 2019, and her writing appears in the anthem Poets of Queens, which comes out this month. Anna is currently pursuing an MFA in Creative Writing Translation at Queens College CUNY. Thank you all. Thank you, Larissa. Um, and welcome everyone to the second live bilingual reading in celebration of Women in Translation Month. Uh, special thanks to Larissa Kaiser and Elizabeth Redfield of the Jill Women Plus in Translation Reading Series for hosting this event. And I'd also like to thank Nancy Naomi Carlson and Sandra Smith, the co-organizers of this reading series. Thanks to the Penn Translation Committee and Penn America who have made this series possible. And a very special thank you to our panelists and to everyone watching. Women in Translation Month is an initiative that was started in 2014 by the blogger Maytal Radzinski to address gender disparity in the field of translation. Women in Translation Month aims to highlight women and non-binary writers and translators whose recognition and representation in literary publishing is essential to freedom of expression. The last few months have been devastating across the world from the COVID-19 pandemic to ongoing police violence to the recent explosion in Beirut. Forces of nationalism, greed, and bigotry are at work trying to divide us and make us distrust each other. Reading translations in this context is more important than ever because translation allows us to connect across language barriers and to consider perspectives we would not otherwise have access to. One of the opportunities that has evolved with the COVID-19 pandemic is an opening up of virtual connection. And to that end, this three-part reading series seeks to feature translators and authors reading together from all over the world often in languages less commonly published in English translation. Today, we are thrilled to present five translators joined live by their authors for bilingual readings from French, Peruvian, Spanish, Persian, Danish, and Polish. The reading will be followed by a short Q&A session if time permits. So please submit your questions for any of the panelists in the comments section, and we'll ask as many as we have time for at the end. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator who will present today's panelists. Nancy Naomi Carlson, twice an NEA grant recipient, has appeared in APR, the Georgia Review, the Paris Review, and Poetry. An infusion of violets published by Siegel in 2019 was called New and Noteworthy by the New York Times. She is a counseling professor professor at Walden University and an editor for Tupelo Quarterly. So I'm turning it over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Anne. And thank you to our panelists and our audience members and the thanks that Anna has given. I have the honor of introducing our first pair of readers, translator Indran Amir Tanayagam and author Katya Sophia Hakim. Indrid Amir Fanayagam writes in English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Haitian Creole. He has published 19 poetry books, including The Migrant States. He edits the Beltway Poetry Quarterly and is a columnist for Haiti en Marche. In addition, he's a winner of the Patterson Prize and is a 2020 Foundation for the Contemporary Arts Fellow. Katia Sophia Hakim is a French poet, critic, translator, and musicologist. She is director of communication and member of the editorial board of Place de la Sorbonne, an international poetry magazine published by the Sorbonne University Press in Paris. 
welcome Indran and Katya Sophia. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, delighted to kick off the reading. Uh, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I will read from poems from a Bacchant in Paris by Katia Sophia Akim, a French poet of Lebanese extract. These are poems about the metro, about trains, and in particular, a woman negotiating her way through the various pitfalls and dangers and challenges of leaving home and working in an urban metropolis. A Bacchant, of course, is a woman from the court of Bacchus. Go ahead, Katia. Thank you, Indra. Une Bacchante à Paris. Caméléon-nous de cols et de confettis. Le métro s'ouvre comme un carnaval. Gang, bang, bar. Arriolé des foules suffocantes. Le vin monte en tête et les heures de pointe défilent avec les wagons. Le trot déraille sur les roues, les vitres en vapeur. Le roulis des rames saccade les corps, corps, ballants, bondés et moites. Des pinces à linge pour une farandole de chiffon. Et moi, dans tout ça, rapiécé comme un arlequin. A Bacchant in Paris. We are chameleons glued, confettied. The metro opens like a carnival. Gang bang of colors, suffocating crowds. Wine gets to the train's head. Rush showers unfurl in parade with the metro cars. Trot of rails on wheels. Windows fogging up, rolling of oars. Shake bodies, bodies dangling, packed and clammy, clothes spins for a dance of rags, and me in all of this, patched like a harlequin. Veuillez m'excuser pour ce retard. Je cours dans les couroirs, perdre la vie plutôt que son train. Mes bas ont filé, les escaliers m'ont cassé de la gueule au talon. Je cours dans les couroirs. Le train me talonne, le train m'a prise. Par les cheveux, je cours dans les couroirs. Une plainte dépasse mon portefeuille. Ne pas toucher, ne pas toucher pour échapper. Mon pied se transforme en main courante. Le corps se vide comme un camembert oublié. Je coule dans les couloirs. Please excuse me for being late. I run in the running lane to lose my life rather than the train. My tights are torn. The stairs have broken me from mug to heel. I run in the running lane. The train stalks me, has seized me by the hair. I run in the running lane. A complaint sticks out of my purse. Don't touch, don't touch. To escape, my foot transformed, a running hand. The body empties like a forgotten camembert. I spill into the swimming lane. Incident voyageur. Ça sent le brûlé sous les roues. Le train a freiné, mais ne s'arrête pas. La force d'inertie tranche le jambon comme une coupe de champagne à jeun. Il ne me reste plus. You can prendre le bus. Traveler's incident. A burning smell under the wheels. The train has applied its brakes, but it does not stop. The force of inertia cuts the hem like a shot of champagne on an empty stomach. I have no choice but to take the bus. Bus de nuit. Les courbes de l'autoroute. Étrangère. Les coudes de l'inconnu, étranger. Corps babalotant à droite, à gauche. Tête trop lourde, jambes trop longues, dos. On ferme l'œil de la nuit, rideaux ouverts, penser au corps, étranger. Amolir le temps, la veste en boule derrière la nuque. Le conducteur en voix off dit « la frontière est proche ». Ça me tue d'improviser des coussins, les tempes contre la vitre. La fosse à bagages, rouille de mort en bas. Il y a des mains, des pieds qui dépassent de la fermeture éclair. 
Les narines entrouvertes battent la chamade. Bientôt la douane. On ramassera ce bouquet d'oreilles comme des ordures sur le trottoir. Night bus. The curves of the highway foreign. Elbows of the unknown foreigner. Bodies swinging from right to left. Heads too heavy. Legs too long. Back. We close the The night's eye, curtains open to think about the foreign body, to soften time. The jacket rolled up behind the neck. The conductor off stage says, the border is near. It kills me to improvise cushions, temples against the glass. The baggage pit swarms with death below. Hands, feet spill out of the zipper, half open nostrils beat like a wild heart. Soon at customs we will gather this bouquet of years like rubbish on the pavement. 29. La nuit est lente comme un train de banlieue. Dernier hiver de ma vingtaine. Mes hanches, deux points, ouvrent les guillemets. Je suis maigre comme à 17 ans. La neige porte les pas de ma mère. Le temps crisse dans un violon, chagrin, chagrin d'une voiture qui ne démarre pas. J'ai battu les blancs des yeux. Ma couleur dans les cheveux fondrait-elle bientôt La nuit en pente comme train de banlieue perce la laine des vieux manteaux bleus. 29. The night is slow like a train in the suburbs. The last winter of my twenties. My hips are colon, open quote marks. I am thin as when I turn 17, the snow bears my mother's steps. The weather screeches in the violin, grinding, grinding like a car that does not start. I have beaten the whites of eyes. The color in my hair, will it melt soon? The night on a slope like a train in the suburbs pierces the wool of old blue blankets. Châtelet, Léal. Châtelet, Léal. Aladdin a perdu sa lampe. Il frotte en vain du revers de sa manche l'écran noir d'un téléphone éteint. Ici, les tapis ne volent pas, ils roulent. Les escaliers ne se prennent que dans un sens. Cela monte, cela descend. Tous s'aplatissent au départ et à l'arrivée en panne d'inspiration. Châtelet, Léal. Châtelet les Alpes. Aladdin has lost his lamp. He rubs in vain with the back of his sleeve the black screen of a turned off telephone. Here, carpets do not fly, they move. Stairs lead in only one direction. These ones go up, those go down. Everything flattens on departure and on arrival in a breakdown of inspiration. Sans titre de transport. Bouche de métro. Bouche de vérité. Théâtre de monde souterrain. Trou noir de couleur. Bouche de trop. À nourrir. À mourir. À voler. Pic. Peau. Quête d'amour. De sac à pied d'œuvre. De mobile du crime. Viol de gambe en l'air du temps. Public. Publicitaire. De l'art et des gens. Livre toujours de poche. Poche, toujours vide. Un peu de brutalité dans un monde de poésie. No ticket. Metro mouth, mouth of truth. Theater of un... Worlds, black holes of colors. Too many mouths to feed, to die, to steal. Pick pocket in search of love. Hands at work in bags. Mobile crime phones. Lola da Gamba in vogue, public advertising, art and people, pocket books always, pockets always empty, a little brutality in a world of poetry. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Indren and Katya Sophia. Our next pair of readers will be translator Jennifer Shu and author Julia Wang. Jennifer Shu 
translates contemporary Cuban and Asian Peruvian writers. She is a graduate of the University of Iowa and Princeton University and was a Fulbright Fellow in Peru. Her translations and writing have appeared in The Offing, Words Without Borders, and Hyper Allergic. Julia Wang is a Peruvian writer of Chinese descent. Born in Chipen, Peru, she has lived on three continents. Her publications, a dozen volumes of poetry, three novels, one novella, one story collection, and two collections of hybrid prose work, including Un Salmón Ciego and Pessoa por Juan. Welcome, Jennifer and Julia. Hi, um, I'm Julia. Pessoa por Juan is the result of a literary workshop with literature professor Maria Alcida Brum, Brazilian but inhabitant of Mexico City. Working with her was intense and productive for a year. It was about reading a bibliography of 12 books by and about Fernando Pessoa, then expressing according to a dynamic that could be equated to automatic writing, poetic trance, and out of fiction. Pessoa por Wong is a hybrid genre where subconscious suspects are pushed out, managed to find a channel thanks to expertise of Maria Alcida. I'm going to read now. Varios yoes pasean por países, personas, textos, simulacros puestos en escena. Lo que queda es lo que se deja, restos de una biografía. La primera vez que me percaté de la fuerza de un llanto bien teatralizado, llevaba un pañuelo en la mano y me di cuenta que podía conseguir muchas cosas si las dramatizaba. Tenía cuatro años y quería que mi papá se subiera al mismo carro que nosotras. Un chofer enviado por un primo de mi papá nos llevaría a Arica, en Chile, por carretera. Nos encantaba viajar. Recuerdo que cada fin de semana íbamos al río a comer en la orilla o en la playa. También habíamos hecho viajes largos a Guaraz y Arequipa. The Art of Pretending. Various eyes walk around countries, people, texts, simulations, mise en scène. What remains is what's left behind, the bones of bi biography. The moment I first figured out the power of a well-staged fit of tears, I I was holding a handkerchief when it hit me that I could achieve a lot with a bit of drama. I was four, and I wanted my papa to get in the same car as us. A driver sent by one of my father's cousins was taking us to Arica in Chile on the highway. We loved to travel. I remember how every weekend we would go to the river and have a meal on its banks or go to the beach. We'd also go on long trips to Huaraz in Arequipa. Mi padre decidió ir dos días después en bus. Entonces yo saqué el pañuelo de una carterita hecha de telar andino que mi mamá me había comprado un día de feria y empecé a lloriquear. Después de unos minutos, mi padre decidió que viajaríamos todos juntos. Había cuatro personas más en el carro. Una niña argentina, una morenita del Sudán, una irlandesa muy católica y una niña que parecía disfrazada de pato. Nunca me había visto como una sola niña, sino como diversos personajes y objetos. Lo que más me representaba es una daga, un instrumento punzante que matará a cualquiera en el momento menos esperado. My father decided to go two days later on a bus. At that point, I took a handkerchief out of the little purse made of Andean cloth that my mamá had bought for me one market day and started to whimper. After a few minutes, my father decided we'd all travel together. There were four other people in the car, an Argentinian girl, a dark-skinned girl from Sudan, a very Catholic Irish girl, and a little girl who appeared to be dressed as a duck. I've never thought of myself as just one little girl, but as different characters and things. I'm best represented by a dagger, a sharp instrument that could kill anyone when least expected. El día que conocí a Julia Wong, 
Me sorprendió mucho su calma. Pensé que era una persona autoritaria, llena de arrogancias y sutilezas extrañas. Pero me encontré una niña muy, muy dolida con la vida. Dolida o sentida. No sé cuál de los dos adjetivos utilizar. En el mundo latinoamericano, las palabras dolor y sentimiento generan una bondad medio extraña, como si con dolerse se generara una piedad filial que ningún razonamiento cabal pudiera lograr. También supe aquel día que la asesinaría. Soy manco. No es terrible no tener una mano. Tuve un accidente de niño, estuve jugando con las máquinas de pulir de mi padre. Me habían prohibido acercarme pero yo no pude negarme a la travesura de acercarme a mover todos esos aparatos tan pintorescos. Apreté el botón indebido por casualidad y la sierra me apretó tres dedos. Cuando I met Julia Wong, I was surprised by how calm she was. I thought she would be authoritarian, full of arrogance and strange subtleties, but what I found was a girl deeply wounded by life. Wounded or earnest, I don't know which of the two adjectives she used. In the Latin world, the words dolor and sentimiento generate a vaguely strange goodness, as if wounding oneself might induce filial piety no sound reasoning could achieve. That was also the day I knew I would kill her. I have one hand. It's not so terrible. As a boy, I had an accident while playing with my father's polishing machines, which I was forbidden to touch, but I couldn't resist the naughtiness of moving all those picturesque parts. I accidentally pressed the wrong button and the saw cut off three fingers. Asesiné a Julia Wong. Era una escritora de mala muerte que repetía la historia de unas niñitas viajando en un Chevy en Perú en todos sus relatos. Esa escritora había redactado varios libros. Digo redactado porque parecían cartas mecanografiadas por una secretaria más que una producción literaria con pies o cabeza provenía del mundo espiritual de las letras hispanas. Esa versión de las niñas, hijas de un chino extraño que viajaba en un Chevy, me había hartado hasta el cansancio. Sus libros estaban en todas las librerías de México. Cuando salió la versión en que las niñas vienen a Veracruz y descubren el paraíso del picante y las tortas mexicanas, fue que decidí eliminarla. Asesiné a Julia Wong en Guadalajara, Jalisco, el día que presentaban la quinta versión de un viaje en Chevy con su padre y su hermana. Era un libro que había sido extremadamente publicitado. El diseño de los banners y posters fue hecho por el mismo publicista que hace la campaña millonaria de unos donuts famosos de todos los colores que se venden alrededor del mundo. I killed Julia Wong. She was a crappy writer who repeated the tale of the girls traveling in a Chevy in Peru and all her stories. This writer had produced various books. I say produced because they read like missives typed up by a secretary more than they read like a literary creation with a head and a tail born of the spiritual world of Spanish letters. That version with the girls, daughters of a strange Chinese man who traveled in a Chevy, I was sick and tired of it. Her books were in all the bookstores in Mexico. When the ver version came out where the girls come to Veracruz and discover a spicy paradise of Mexican sandwiches, I decided to eliminate her. I killed Julia Wong in Guadalajara, Jalisco, the day of her book launch for the fifth version of the trip in the Chevy with her father and sister. It was a highly publicized book. The banners and posters were designed by the same publicist behind the million dollar campaign for some famous donuts that come in all the colors and are sold all over the world. Sí. Se esperaba que el libro de Julia Wong rompiera los récords de venta y superara con creces las ventas de Paulo Coelho, incluso con la salvedad de que contando ella ciertas actitudes sadomasoquistas del padre chino que transportaba a las niñas en el Chevy, el aura del libro tendría un elemento literario más elaborado que las incapacidades de Paulo Coelho para darse cuenta que su discurso sobre alquimia y la sanación del ser humano a través de historias aburridas con moraleja estaban quedando rezagadas a las bibliotecas de ama de casa frígidas y maestros de economía que habían hecho un posgrado en las peores universidades de Estados Unidos. La decisión de eliminar a Julia Wong del espectro y de cualquier catálogo fue un acto de depuración cristiana a favor de las letras hispanoamericanas. So there were 
Investors hoped Julia Wang's book would break sales records and far surpass the sales of Paulo Coelho, even with the proviso that when she recounted certain sadomasochistic ten tendencies in the Chinese father who transported the girls in a Chevy, the book's aura had a much more developed literary character than Paulo Coelho's inability to realize that his discourse on alchemy and healing the human spirit through boring stories with a moral was getting left in the dust of the di libraries of cold housewives and economics professors with graduate degrees from the worst universities in the United States. The decision to eliminate Julia Wong from the spectrum in all catalogs was an act of Christian purification and a favor to Hispanophone letters. Una daga. Una daga comprada en una tienda de antigüedades, en Lagunilla, en la Ciudad de México, en un establecimiento vintage, muy surtido. Ni siquiera pregunté por el tipo de daga. Parecía que el dependiente me esperaba y que podía adivinar lo que yo quería. Me dijo incluso que la muerte de Julia Wong ya estaba preparada, de antemano por el mismo publicista que la había hecho famosa. Es que con el tiempo convirtió a la escritora en un donant más y la ofrecía tal cual, en lugar de tendero, tendero de libros, escritora, poeta, o al menos como redactora de historias que se repiten. I used a dagger, a dagger bought in an antique store in Lagunilla in Mexico City, a vintage establishment with a large assortment of things. I didn't ask for the specific type of dagger, it felt like the shop assistant was waiting for me and could guess what I wanted. He even said the death of Julia Wong had been prepared beforehand by the same publicist who made her famous. What happened was, with time, he turned the writer into just another donut, and he presented her as such, instead of as a bookshop keeper, writer, poet, or at the very least, producer of repetitive stories. That's all we have time for today, but thank you um, to Jill on the Pan Translation Committee. Um, and it's been such a pleasure to work so closely with Julia on this text and her poetry. Um, if you'd like to read the rest of this section from Pessoa Pod Wong, the entirety of The Art of Pretending is forthcoming from the journal A Perfect Vacuum at aperfectvacuum.club. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Julia. Our next pair of readers will be translator Lida Nosrati and author Sahar Sahoy. Lida Nosrati is a literary translator whose poems and tra translations of contemporary Iranian poetry and short fiction have appeared in The Apostles Review, Words Without Borders, Matters of Feminist Practice, and elsewhere. She has received fellowships from the Banff International Literary Translation Center, Yado, and the Bread Loaf Translators Conference. Sahar Sahoy is a writer, musician, and ethnomusicologist who lives in Tehran. She has collaborated with leading classical Persian musicians as a tar player and has composed the soundtrack for two feature films. Today's reading will be from When the Gazelle Was Still Breathing, a personal narrative on the history of absence. Welcome, Lita and Sahar. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy, uh, Anna, Sandra, for appreciating this. Thank you to Jill and the Larissa and Pan Translation Committee. Uh, uh, for hosting this. It's such an honor to be in this wonderful company. So uh, Sahar and I will be reading excerpts from an essay um, uh, that is about absence, the history of absence uh, that is personal and absence in the context of uh, contemporary history of Iran particularly the contemporary history of Iranian music. Um, Sahar, do uh, um, Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be part of this program. And I, I will read the text in Persian. Thank you. I think that my father was not a 
پنج سالم بود بخش بزرگی از روز شبم را با پدر بزرگ و مادر بزرگم می گذارندم. والدین مادرم همانها که حالا قرار بود برای دیدار دختر بزرگشان چند ماهی بروند دامما این طولانی ترین نبودنی بود تا آن روز که قرار بود تجربه کنم چند روزی قهر بودم روزهای آخری که چمدان می بستند هر زرشک و زعفران و سبزی قرمه‌ای که می‌پیچیدند لای پلاستیک‌های زخیم تا سالم به دست خالم برسد برای من دشنام و ناسزا بود نباید می‌رفتم اگر دیگر برنمیگشتند چی غیاب در دنیای کودکی من با هیچ وقت نبودن فرق نداشت نمی‌خواستم بروم I think grandpa never forgave me I was five and a good chunk of my days and nights were spent with my grandparents my mother's parents who were going to Denmark for a few months to visit their elder daughter. This was by far the longest absence I was about to experience. I was mad at them. On the last days leading to the trip, with every bag of Barbary, Saffron, El Gorme, Sabzi, they double and triple bag, so they reached my aunt unscathed, it was like a slap in my face. They should not leave. What if they never come back? Absence in my childhood world was no different than death. I didn't want them to go. چند ساعتی پیش از آن که پیکان یخچالی برسد دم در و سوارشان کند به مقصد فرودگاه دندان مصنوعی پدر بزرگم را برداشتم و بعد از کلی نقشه چیدن تصمیم گرفتم پشت شوپاژ یکی از اتاقهای خانه سر بنیستش کنم مطمئن بودم آن پدر بزرگی که من میشناختم بدون دندانهایش جایی نخواهد رفت مطمئن بودم اینجوری مسیر سرنوشت را عوض میکنم مطمئن بودم کسی به من شک نمی کند من که تنها نوه خانواده بودم A couple of hours before my grandparents were picked up by the chocolate cake on headed to the airport I snatched my grandfather's dentures and after some thorough schematizing decided to lose them behind the radiator in one of the rooms I was certain the grandfather I knew would didn't go anywhere without his dentures I was certain I would change the course of destiny doing that that No one would have a shred of doubt about me, the only grandchild in the family. سالها بعد وقتی تلخین خاطره در گذر روزهای عمر من و پدر بزرگ گرفته شد و این اتفاق یک شوخی خانوادگی محبوب شد فهمیدم تمام محاسباتم در پنج سالگی به شکل ابلهانه غلط بوده بدون شک و تردیدی همه چشم ها به من خیره شدند کتک مفصلی خوردم مادرم از خجالت بغز کرد و پدرم از داشتن دختری مثل من اظهار پشیمانی کرد اما من قهرمانانه جای دندان رو لو ندادم و البته پدر بزرگم بدون دندان در فرودگاه کوپنهاگ به زمین نشست یک شکست به تمام معنا دو ماه ماندنشان در دانمارک شد چش ماه و من برخلاف تصوراتم تا یک جایی دلتنگ و دلتنگتر شدم و بعد مثل سگی که به نبودن صاحبش کو کند آرام آرام به جای خالیشان عادت کردم این اولین برخورد نزدیک من با قیاب بود. من از دوری نمردم اما آن پدر بزرگی که رفت همان پدر بزرگی نبود که برگشت. انگار در فاصله چیزهای عوض شده بود. Years later, when time softened the bitter edge of this memory and made it a popular inside joke in the family, I realized how terribly off my five-year-old calculations were. Of course, all, all eyes turned to me. I got a good beating. My mother choked up. And my father was ashamed of having a daughter like me. But, in the fashion, but I, in the fashion of a true hero, never disclosed the whereabouts of the dentures. And my grandfather landed at the Copenhagen airport toothless, a full-on defeat. What was to be a two-month stay in Denmark became six months. And I, despite myself, missed them more and more until I gradually got used to their absence, like a house dog who gets used to the absence of its owner. This was my first close encounter with absence. I didn't die of distance, but the grandfather who returned wasn't the same as the one who left. Distance had changed things. سالها بعد در مقاله از فروید خواندم در مشاهداتش از بازی که کودک سه ساله متوجه می شود کودک با پشت کار و اشتیاق از با بازیش را به دورترین کنجهای خانه پرتاب می کند و هر بار می گوید رفت. روی در مشاهدات بعدی کشف می کند کودک در مرحله بعدی بازیش همان اسباب بازی ها را پیدا می کند و با شوق فریاد می کشد اینهاش نتیجه گیری فروید اساره دوران کودکی بود کودک بازی ناپدید شدن و بازگشتن می کند تجربه از دست دادن چیزهای دوست داشتنی مقدمه بازگشت لذت 
بخششان است و کودک این را ناخداگاه می داند. بدون قیاب حضور بی معن است. Years later, I read in an essay by Freud, who in his observations of a three-year-old three at play, finds that the child persistently and enthusiastically throws his toys to the furthermost corner of the room, gone, exclaiming every time. In his later observations, in the next phase of the game, he notices the child bursting into a cheerful scream, finding the very same toys. Freud's conclusion was the quintessential definition of childhood. A child engages in a game of disappearing and returning. The experience of losing what one loves is an epilogue to its happy return, and the child subconsciously knows that. Without absence, presence has no meaning. تاریخ قیاب در این سرزمینی که نامش ایران است تاریخ پرآب چشمی است. هر روز و هر شب کسانی رفته اند، قایب شده اند، حذف شده اند، کم رنگ شده اند، و بقیه کشیده اند مثل لشکر موچگان به یاری هم دیگر بیایند. قیاب چهره ندارد. قیاب جنسیت هم ندارد. همانقدر قمر است که شجریان. همانقدر دیروز است که امروز. همانقدر کوتاه است که همیشگی. همانقدر تابستان است که زمستان. پاییز است که بهار. The history of absence in this land called Iran is one fraught with tears. Every day and every night some leave, some become absent, some are erased, some fade and the rest come to each other's rescue like an army of ants. Absence has no face, no gender. It is as much shajarian as it is qamar. It is as much yesterday as it is today, as brief as it is eternal, as much summer as winter, as much fall as it's spring. پنج ساله هم و دندان صورتی و سنگین پدر بزرگم توی دستم است. گوشه یکی از دندان های عقبی تکه سبزی کوچک مانده و یکی از دندان های جلوی هم کدرتر از بقیه است. وقتی دو سوی دندان ها را به هم میکوبانی صدای شبیه قاشقک های اسپانیایی می دهد که زن های صرف پوش موقع رقصیدن می نوازد. مادر بزرگم حاضر و آماده نشسته توی سالن و مادرم دارد آخرین توصیه ها را می کند. پدر بزرگ و پدرم گرم گفتگو هستند. چمدان های بزرگ و کوچکشان مثل دسته کودکان یتیم پشت در آماده رفتنند. به در دیوان خانه نگاه می کنم و دلم تنگ می شود. به دنباله پیراهن بنفش مادر بزرگم نگاه می کنم و دلم تنگ می شود. برای بوی دیره و دارچین و آب لیموی خانهشان دلم تنگ می شود. برای کباب های پدر بزرگم دل تنگ می شود. برای خندیدنش که با دندان مختدر است و بدون دندان ترحم برانگیز دلم تنگ می شود. دندان را پرت می کنم پشت شفاج و بر می گردم می نشینم کنار مامان. قلبم می زند. احساس می کنم درست روی نقطه ای ایستاده ام که سوزنبان در آن می ایستد و مسیر حرکت قطار را عوض می کند. چرا آدم ها از هم دور می شوند وقتی می دانند زندگی خیلی کوتاه است؟ چرا آدم های آدم های دیگر را به قیاب تبعید می کنند وقتی می دانند هیچ زیبایی تا ابد پنهان نمی ماند؟ پس ما کی می خواهیم بزرگ شویم؟ چرا نمی شود با یک دندان مصنوعی مسیر دنیا را عوض کرد؟ I am five years old. And holding my grandfather's heavy pink dentures in my hands. A piece of herb is stuck in one of the back molars, and one front tooth is darker in shape than the rest. The clatter of the two rows against each other sounds like the castanets of a flamenco dancer in her red dress. My grandmother is ready to go, and my mother is giving the last obligatory pre-trip instructions. My father and grandfather are in deep in conversation, Suitcases of all sizes are lined up by the door like a row of orphan children, ready to leave. I look around the house and suddenly miss it right there. I look at the long frill of my, grandmother, my grandmother's purple dress and miss her right there. I already miss the scent of cumin and cinnamon and freshly squeezed lime in their house. I miss my grandfather's kebabs. I miss his laughter, so full of authority with his dentures on. and so heart-wrenching without. I throw the dentures behind the radiator and come back to sit next to my mother. My heart is pounding. I feel I'm standing right at the point where the train spotter changes the track routes. Why do people move away when they know life is so short? Why do some send others to an exile of absence when they know no beauty remains hidden for good? When do we want to grow up? Why can't one change the course of destiny with a set of dentures? Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Lita and Sahar. Our next pair of readers will be translator Sharon Hanna Miyamosa. Sharon e. Rhodes has published literary translations from Danish as well as from the Old English. She's a recent graduate of the BCLT Literary Translation Summer School. In addition to H.H.P. Fredrickson, she's working on a translation of Martin Larson's Parasite Sonnets. Rhodes is also a poet. Hanna Vienna holds a degree in anthropology and ethnography. She is the author of three novels, a collection of poems and short prose pieces, and was nominated for the 2020 Nordic Council Literature Prize. She also won the 2019 Danish Montana's Literary Prize. She currently lives and works in Reykjavik. Welcome, Sharon and Hannah. Hi, thank you. Um, so we'll be reading from our most recent novel, which is H. H. B. Fredrickson, and uh, I think the, the best summary comes from Denmark's uh, newspaper information, which uh, sums up the book as a heartrending, relentless mess of a novel about sex, power, and blood. Um, we'll be reading a part that takes place in Iceland, but the novel winds its way through Iceland, Denmark, and Peru, and a very large range of topics. Um, so we'll start with Kenna. Um, am I on? Can you hear me now? Yeah. I will read the part. Jeg kører fra Isafjordur, en fjordvejen mod Sydervik. Der ligger store mængder rød tang i vandkanten. Bowie synger It's a Miracle. Jeg synger ba 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 u. I dag, da jeg vågnede, jeg sov i bilen på en resteplads oven for Isafjordur. På bagsædet med benene ud af den åbne dør. Lige ud i en klynge lupiner, der fortsatte i brede blå plavager ned ad fjeldsiden. Kørte jeg ned til byen, den hvide by ved fjorden. Gik rundt og så på nye og gamle huse og gader. Grødlabiler lykkelige drev jeg omkring og drømte om nye begyndelser. Når jeg kører, drøner stemmen i mit hoved. Men når jeg stanser for at skrive, går den i stå, og ingen sætninger kommer længere af sig selv. Alle ord falder klodset ud. Det ene indfald afløser ikke det andet. Sidste sommer skrev jeg, mens jeg kørte. Jeg havde kuglepind og blok på sædet ved siden af og kunne skrive uden at se på papiret. Jussisk Hjælp mig ud fra min kørsel forleden. Vi sad på tagterrassen af Babalu på skolervørdelsdikker. Du kører sindssygt. Tag dig sammen. Du har børn at tage dig af. Og så skred han. Han, der ikke har børn at tage sig af, eller hvad? Han, der fik et klip i kortet de sidste uge, da politiet dansede ham en nat. Da han kørte rundt med sit deliriske hoved. Idéerne hissigt myldrende frem som vipse fra alle sprækker og kanaler. Jeg betalte, gik op af skolervørdelsdikker til Halgrimskirken, op i tårnet, det stiveste protestantiske tårn i verden. Der stod jeg højt oppe i den nordiske himmel, i det tårn, der som jeg altid bemærker, når vi kommer kørende til byen fra lufthavnen, udefra set minder om en overdimensioneret Kuklus klan hætte. Nu sidder jeg på Amahabi, har lige spist fish and chips, den friskeste fisk, Fisk, jeg endnu har fået på en dejne, en fladfisk af en art, stigt, hellefisk måske. Helt frisk, nærmest sprældende på min tunge. Jeg savner mine børn, en mand, en kvinde, en ven. I drive from Isafjordur down a few road to the Kivik, where large clumps of red seaweed float in the shallows. Bowie sings, it's a miracle. I sing, baba, baba u. Today, when I woke up, I slept in the car at a rest stop above Isafjord on the back seat with my legs hanging out the open door, right out into a cluster of the lupins that grow in broad patches all down the mountainside. I drove down toward the city, the white city by the fjord, ran around and looked at new and old houses and streets. Weepily and happily, I drove around and dreamed of new beginnings. When I drive, the voice in my head roars, but when I stop to write, it goes quiet and no further sentences materialize on their own. Every word falls out clumsily. The one gambit does not replace the other. Last summer I wrote while I drove. 
I had a pen and pad on the seat beside me, and I could write without looking at the paper. Yusi called me out from my driving the other day. We sat on the roof terrace of Babalu on Skolovor Gustiga. You drive crazy. Pull yourself together. You have children to think of. And then he went on and on as if he didn't have children to think of himself. He, the man who got three points on his license just last week, the police stopped him at night when he was driving around with his delirious head, volatile ideas swarming forth like wasps from every crack and crevice. I paid, walked, walked up Skola Vordistiga, the Hallgrim's church, climbed up on the tower, the stiffest Protestant tower in the world, <coughs> where I stood high up in the Nordic sky. There in the place that I always say, as we drive to the city from the airport, reminds me from the outside of an, of an oversized Ku Klux Klan hood. Now I'm sitting in a diner in Sudavik, and Habi, having just eaten fish and chips, the freshest fish I've ever gotten at a diner, some sort of flat fish, fried, halibut maybe, so fresh, almost wriggling on my tongue. I miss my, my children, a man, a woman, a friend, Mm-hmm. Nogle gange får jeg fornemmelsen af, at vi alle sammen går rundt i en eller anden for mennesker og en usynlig børnehave, og guderne sidder på en pladsanvisning i himlen og brøler af grin. En dårlig barndom, en ny rød traktor, et misbrug, en psykose, en lille dinosaur, en kamphund i menneskebørnenes sandkasse. Jeg gider ikke mere, er så træt, vil gerne have sommerferie. Jeg vil gerne vide, hvordan man melder sig ud af den her institution. Kan man opsige sit abonnement? Går det gennem en kommune i himlen? Kan man få kørselsfradrag, hvis man kører lige lugt mod helvede? Skal man undgå tunnelen? Er man nu igen kommet til det yderste hegn? Sometimes I get thinking that we, all of us, are walking around in some kind of invisible kindergarten to the human eye. And the gods are sitting at some sort of judge's table in the sky and roaring with laughter. A bad childhood, a new red tractor, an abuse, a psychosis, a little dinosaur, a pit bull in the human children's sandbox. I don't want this anymore. I am so tired. I want it to be summer break. I want to know how you withdraw from this institution. Can you cancel your subscription? Does it go through some sort of bureaucracy in the sky? Can you get a mileage allowance if you drive straight to hell? Should you avoid the tunnel? Have you now again reached the outermost fence? Bo is saying, seven days to live my life, or seven ways to die. Jeg gider ikke tilbage til Reykjavik. Jeg vil aldrig mere hjem. Arctic Fox spiller i Sydavik. I billeder, der er lurt, er der et Simonstrøm Museum. Jeg savner mine børn. Der er et form med to lam på vejen. De løber ikke ind til siden. Jeg vil gerne være en god mor. Jeg vil gerne være et godt menneske. Jeg tror, jeg er en idiot. I'm afraid of Americans, skriger Bowie. I'm afraid of arrogance. I'm afraid of the world. Jeg overhaler forerne. De løber stadig på vejen. Jeg har stanset for at skrive dette. De nærmer sig i bagspejlet. Er de nysgerrige? Nu kommer de. Nu står de og glor. Lammene vender siden til snuser, finder moderens padborter og begynder at dige der midt på vejen, mens hun stiger stift på bilen på mine øjne i spejlet. En bæk finder vej gennem limegrønt mos. Nu er jeg oppe. Næste fjord åbner sig dernede. Der er et kort på et skilt. Hestfjordur, Skotofjordur, Mjovifjordur, Isafjordur og så Holmervik. Jeg sidder i bilen, ser på kortet gennem ruden. Hvorfor er jeg pludselig blevet liderlig? Jeg masserer min kusse gennem trusserne. Bowie er glad. Oh, I'm happy. Hope you're happy too. Hvorfor er jeg liderlig nu? Bilen ryster. Hvad sker der? Jeg vil knalle. Det er blæsten, der rykker i bilen. Jeg kører igen. Hest, du. Jeg savner at blive voldtaget. På ingen går en flok svaner. Thank you. Bowie sang seven days. Seven days to live my life with seven days to die. I don't want to go back to the lake. I never want to go home again. There's the Arctic Fox Center in Sudavik. In Bildedala, there's a sea monster museum. I miss my children. There's a sheep with two lambs on the road. 
they're not running to the side. I want to be a good mother. I want to be a good person. I think I'm an idiot. I'm afraid of Americans, whales Bowie. I'm afraid of arrogance. I'm afraid of the world. I overtake the sheep. They're still running down the road. I stop to write this. They approach in the rear view mirror. Are they curious? Now they're coming. Now they stand and stare. The lambs turn to the side, sniff, find their mother's teeth, and begin to nurse, nurse there in the middle of the road while she stares unwaveringly at the car, at my eyes in the mirror. A stream finds its way through the lime green moss. Now I'm up. The next fjord opens below. There's a map on a signpost. Hes fjorda, Skoda fjorda, Mjö fjorda, Isa fjorda, and then Homovik. I sit in the car, look at the map through the window. Why am I suddenly horny? I press my cunt through my underwear. Bowie's happy. Oh, I'm happy. Hope you're happy too. Why am I horny now? The car shakes. What's happening? I want to fuck. It's the wind blowing in the car. I drive again. Hes fjorda. I miss being raped. The flock of swans walks on the meadow. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon and Hannah. Our final pair of readers will be translator Karen Kovacic and Christina Dombroszka. Karen Kovacic is a poet and translator of Polish poetry. She has has twice been awarded fellowships in literary translation from the National Endowment for the Arts and is the translator of Jacek Denel's Aperture, a finalist for the 2019 Penn Award for Poetry and Translation. She's also the editor of Scattering the Dark, an anthology of Polish women poets. Krystyna Dombrowska is a poet, essayist, translator, and author of several collections, including the following titles, which I'll say in English, Time and Aperture and Soundtracks. In 2013, she won three of the most prestigious Polish literary prizes, the Szymborska Award, the Kościelski Award, and the Literary, literary Award of the capital city of Warsaw. Welcome, Karen and Christina. Nancy, and thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for your beautiful readings. Yeah, I would like to add my thanks as well um, to Larissa uh, and Sandra, Naomi, Nancy, Naomi, and Anna for uh, putting all of this together. It's in some ways, especially here in the U.S., we feel so isolated at the moment, and um, this reading is, has been wonderful. So uh, we're just, we're going to read four poems in both languages. Uh, m most of these are recent. Kristina uh, just wrote them this year, or they're from her most recent book. So Kristina. Rozpaczulga. Znacie tę roślinę, rozpaczulgę? Kiedy pożar zdusi już do szczętu słowo ty, tobie, z tobą, przez ciebie, dym pobudzi kiełkowanie i nasion. Kwiat ma ciężki jak czarna piwonia, lecz opadłe płatki są lekkie. Korzeniami sięga do początków zakończonej historii, jej kolce kaleczą, sok z liści, okłady z nich i napar leczą. Od owoców można dostać torsji lub się uzależnić. Zapomniane w kieszeni zamienią się w grzechotki i będą wygrywać przy każdym kroku desperacki rytm. Rozpaczulga, ulga, rozpacz, rozpaczulga. Jej zapach drażni ja, ledwo zipiące. Czekajcie, zaraz kichnie i trochę się otrząśnie. This poem, um, I mean imagines a, a plant that one would encounter after a relationship ends, sarabalm. Do you know the plant sarabalm? When fire stifles every trace of the word you, you, for you, with you, because of you, smoke spurs the germination of its seeds. Its blossoms hang heavy as a black peonies, yet its drooping petals are light. Its roots penetrate the beginnings of a story that's come to an end. Its thorns sear, but a tea or compress from its leaves can heal. 
its fruit can be habit forming, cause nausea. Forgotten in a pocket, it becomes a rattle, beating a frantic rhythm with every step. Sour, sour balm, sour balm balm. For the eye, barely breathing, its scent galls. Wait, here comes a sneeze to clear the head at last. Kotwyk. Po ciemku nie widać, że jest różowy w białe wiewiórki i jak strzażały jego róż i biele. Maga od czasu, gdy na wiewiórki wołała króliczki z uszkami. Musiała go dotykać, żeby zasnąć. Najważniejszy był jeden róg, cały w strzępach, od miętolenia i ssania, impregnowany dziecięcą śliną, jak brezent, przez który nie przeniknie jawa. Ten ściurany róg kocyka dostał nawet specjalne imię. Nikt oprócz dziecka nie potrafił go wymówić. Próbuje teraz je odtworzyć, sepleniącą monosylabę, coś jakby angielskie the po praniu the znikało. Nie rozumiała gdzie. Kocyk zmieniał się w jakiś obcy, czysty przedmiot. Trzeba było na nowo ożywić go sobą. Tyle lat, a nie zginął. Czeka pod poduszką, by przyłożyć do niego bezsenny policzek, poczuć róg cały w strzępach, potargane nitki. Z godziny na godzinę ciemności bieleją. Pod powiekami skaczą różowe ogniki. Chodźcie tutaj, wiewiórki, króliczki z łóżkami. Oddam wam orzechy, zbyt twarde do zgryzienia. Blanki. In the dark, you can't see the squirrels and how the pink and white has grayed. She's had it from the time she called squirrels bunnies with little ears. She'd have to fondle it to fall asleep. Most important was one corner, all frayed from stroking and sucking, saturated with her childish spit like a tarp the waking world couldn't penetrate. That ratty corner of her blankie even had a special name no one but the child could pronounce. She tries now to recreate it, the lisping monosyllable, something like the in English. After being washed, the vanished. She didn't know where. Her blankie had become something sanitized and strange. She'd have to bring it back to life with her touch. In all these years, it never got lost. It waits beneath her pillow to press against a sleepless cheek. That corner, all in tatters, threads full of snags. Hour by hour, the darkness turns white, tiny pink under her eyelids. Come here, squirrels, bunnies with little ears, and I'll offer up these nuts too hard to crack. Nasz język. Kiedy mówisz, czy mogę jeszcze pospać, bo mam w sobie bryłę snu i ona musi się roztopić jak lód na wiosnę. Kiedy narzekam na zastój w pisaniu, a ty radzisz, cierpliwości ucz się jej ode mnie. Na co jarzę to tak, jakby się uczyć wegetarianizmu od kota. Kiedy wspominamy naszą całonocną jazdę w wietnamskie góry, wytrząsaczem wspomnień. Albo jak w jednej z europejskich stolic rozglądaliśmy się gwałtownie za podwórkiem moczo oddajnym. Kiedy spotykamy się w pół drogi między moją a twoją sekluzją i ruszamy na obchód dzielnicy, a w oknach stare kobiety opierają łokcie na poduszkach obserwacyjnych. Chcę wtedy wciągnąć nasz język na listę zagrożonych języków mniejszości. Pozna go tylko dwoje ludzi, i trudno go ochronić, a równocześnie na listę najmocniejszych, bo jak na razie chroni nas. Our language. When you say, can I sleep a little longer since this chunk of dream has to melt in me like ice in a spring? When I complain about a writing slump and you counsel, take it easy, same as me, to which I say, that's like learning vegetarianism from a cat. 
When we recall our all-night trip in a shaker of memories to the Vietnamese mountains, or how in a certain European capital, we found ourselves looking urgently for a pea-friendly courtyard. When we meet halfway between your solitude and mine and make the rounds of the neighborhood where old women prop elbows on sentinel pillows, I want to place what we speak on a list of endangered minority languages because only two people know it and it's hard to preserve, but also on a list of the strongest because for now it shelters us. And the last one. Rzeźby dla niewidomych. W muzeum sztuki, gdzie rządzi wzrok, rzeźby dla niewidomych. Te same, do których widzący nie mogą podchodzić zbyt blisko. Stopa wysunięta za czerwoną linię, wścibianie nosa w pustkę po antycznym nosie i alarm. Wolno tylko patrzeć, aż się zmienisz w kamienne gałki oczne na szypułkach wydłubane z marmurowej greckiej głowy. Ślepi oglądają je palcami. Dotykają szramy na brzuchu cklackiej dziewczyny, walki smoków na odwrocie koreańskiego lustra, co powstało tysiąc lat przed naszą erą, lepią na nowo. Mówią kubek, zban i napełniają winem. Uwolnione z gablot sznury paciorków monet stukają im w rękach, o zyskach i stratach, o szemranych transakcjach. Kołatka oddaje im swój ciężar, przypomina sobie drzwi. Spróbuję je otworzyć po macku. Sculptures for the blind. In the museum where vision rules, there are sculptures for the blind, the same ones the sighted can't approach too close. Let a foot creep past the red line or poke your nose in the hollow of some ancient nose, alarms wail. Only looking is allowed till you feel yourself turn into those stone eyeballs on long stems dug out of a marble head from Greece. The blind view sculptures with their fingers. They trace a scar on the belly of a cycladic girl the battle of dragons on the backside of a Korean mirror. What arose thousands of years ago, they create anew, saying pitcher, cup, which they fill again with wine. In their hands, strings of money beads freed from the display, rattle gains and losses, shady deals gone down. A bronze knocker lends them its weight conjures up a door. Try to open it in the dark. Thank you. And thank you, Karen and Christina. So it's been truly a privilege to hear all these talented voices from around the globe. We've heard Persian and Danish and French and Spanish and Polish. It's a world in my, my ears. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. And I'm wondering if you have any to uh, type them in the chat book for us. Uh, I see one about how translators find their authors. Did any of you like to comment on that, please? And vice versa, how authors find their translators. Just feel free to turn on your Um, I can start. Um, uh, I actually found Julia's work uh, through a book of scholarship about um, Peruvian writers of Chinese descent by the uh, scholar Nasser Lopez Calvo. Um, and then, yeah, we started working together. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with her in person when I was in Peru um, on Fulbright this past year. Um, but in general, um, uh, Friends will recommend me things, just reading around books, like, uh, you know, different bookstores when I'm in country. Um, that's how I usually find my work that I translate. Um, I, I can say something. I, you know, there are very 
few benefits, uh, quarantine and this confinement and all that. <laughs> but one of the very few has been this, the wonderful, for me, discovery of, of Katya's poetry, you know, and I found her uh, just looking online. Uh, so social media can be helpful. <laughs> you can actually find amazing work. Um, and so that's how I found her. We just to uh, come across each other and um, then started to write and then uh, and from there, you know, uh, the, this collaboration. So that's how just looking online, looking who, to who is writing and who is sending work to different places. Yeah. And others. I was doing an internship uh, about four years ago in Copenhagen and uh, at, a, at a press that had published one of Hannah's earlier books um, that, that she just happened to be in town. She was already living mostly in Iceland um, and I, I met her at a bar one night and uh, then uh, when her most recent novel came out, um, uh, a friend of mine told me about it and I yeah, so a long, strange journey. Lita, you were going to say something. Yes, I'm just going to say that um, uh, for me, the friendship came first before the translation. I have uh, the great fortune of uh, knowing Sahar as a friend through another her dearly beloved friend, uh, who's a wonderful musician, uh, classical Persian singer, Sefi Deray uh, So I uh, was friends with Sahar, and then her work came to me. I read her novel, uh, her first novel, a few years back when I was in Tehran. And uh, then this particular essay was uh, quite uh, serendipitous. Thanks to the pandemic, I was uh, looking for another text in a website, um, in a uh, uh, website on literature, and then uh, just came upon this essay and was just captivated by how these threads, two very different threads of absence, personal and historical, have been so beautifully woven together and how it's possible to magically talk about absence and still hope against hope in the context of today, in the context of today's Iran, in the context of today's world. So that's what drew me to, uh, to this uh, wonderful essay and, and also how it resisted being translated, uh, which is I think always uh, the, the, the best uh, motivation for every translator. You just want to attack a text that doesn't want to be translated. So. Anyone else for that question? Sure. Uh, so, uh, 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 Krisha is translated by um, several uh, English language translators. Antonia Lloyd-Jones, who was uh, the first person, I believe, who translated translated your work into English, and um, Mira Rosenthal, a wonderful translator, and uh, both of them have kindly shared Krisha with me. Uh, and I think when I met uh, after my anthology, Scattering the Dark, came out, a couple, New York, yes. we, did, yeah, we did a reading in New York to kind of a book launch, and uh, that's when we personally met. Yes, and it was really a wonderful venture because Karen invited me to, with other poets, to read from her anthology of Polish uh, women poets. And so we, we, we read in New York and in uh, California. It was really fantastic. Okay. So this was the beginning. Uh, we have a, a few more questions, but we don't have much time. So, one question is, what do you do when you find a word that can't be translated? Do you stop being a translator and become an author? And where's that line between translation and creation? 
I, I just maybe offer one brief example there. So the first poem that uh, Krisha read, Ros Pachulga, um, it's, it's kind of a portmanteau word because it's this make-believe plant. And in, so it's, it's like Ros Pach is sorrow and Ulga is belief. And in Polish, Ros Pachulga actually sounds kind of like a plant like from folk medicine or something. And so, but, but if I were to translate that absolutely literally into English, sorrow, relief, it wouldn't sound like a plant. Um, and so, so I guess uh, my challenge was to find a word that isn't relief uh, that would sound plant-like. So I went with sorrow balm, like bee balm or, you know, whatever. Um, so you know, maybe this doesn't fully answer your question, but I think translators are always looking for workarounds. You know, if, if one way doesn't work because it wouldn't have the resonance that the original does, let's see if we can find another way. Yeah, I, I think if I can say something that the translators are always authors, you know, because they, are, they always have to be creative and um, you always have have to find other ways in your native uh, language to bring something that is just totally different. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I would like to say something. It's not exactly for that question, sure. but uh, uh, English and Spanish are very, it's just a strange combination for Jennifer and me, because the main point about Jennifer and me is the Chinese soul. It's not, not the language, it's how we feel being Chinese and living in countries where it is not the soul of your, of, of your own, you know? I've seen the others keep living, for, for example, Sahar or Christina, they still live in Poland or whatever, and they have very deep connection with the, with the country. But I'm Chinese descendant, and, and Jennifer is also Chinese descendant, so she lives in a, as a migrant, and I live also as a migrant. This combination made the creation not more difficult, but more, how can I tell you, more special, because you have to find like a triangle between your own language, the language you're living in, and the translation to the other. And I think that makes that the thing is very, very geometrical or very different than when it's your mother language or your, your own roots are rooted in the poem or in the text. No? And that's what it was very amazing to work with her because she was in Peru, she, she learns, she speaks Spanish perfect, but it's not her mother language. And the point was about our soul, our Spanish soul being translated also as well in, in Chinese, in, pardon, in, in English as in Spanish. So it looks like we're, we're out of time. Perfect, perfectly timed. Uh, this is the, the end of our second in a series of three Women in Translation readings. We're delighted everyone could join us. We have the third, uh, the third reading is going to take place next Thursday, August 7th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And that will be taking place on the Pen America website. Um, there'll be a link. I want to thank everyone once again, the Pen and Translation Committee, to my co-organizers, Anna Dinwoody and Sandra Smith, who is on this, this call, but she has helped. She's been just helpful as either of the three of us. And um, also our hosts, Larissa Kaiser and Lisbeth Redfield, who is also not on this call, but who we have a lot of people behind, work behind the scenes. And of course, we thank you, the audience, for joining us. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Bye-bye. Thank you.